ಸಂಗೋಪಕ್ರಮೋಪನಿಷದೈರ್ ಗಾಯಂತಿಯಂಗ ಧ್ಯಾನಸ್ಥಿತಗತೆ ನ ಮನಸ ಪಶ್ಯಂತಿಯಂಗ ಯೋಗಿ ಜಸ್ಯಾಂತಂಗನಸುರಸುರಗನ ದೇವಾಯ ತಸ್ಮೈ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಆವರ್ ಸಲ್ಯೂಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಟ್ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಅ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಹುಮ್ ದಿ ಸೇಜಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ಬೈ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ನೇಮ್ಸ್ our salutations to him whose glory has been sung through the rapturous hymns of the scriptures of the world but whose limitless and infinite glory none can comprehend but again whom the sages and devotees realize within their hearts in their deepest contemplation him we salute again and again may he shine in our hearts manifest there in all his glory and dispel all darkness and ignorance om shanti 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 peace 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 our subject this morning self effort and divine grace sri ramakrishna used to classify mankind into four divisions or other five divisions one is those who are born with the knowledge of god at this point again let me point let me make it clear that the purpose of human life is to realize to experience god which again means to experience the true being within ourselves take for instance our whole life is centered around i our whole world is centered around our sense of ego but what this i exactly is nobody knows nobody enquires and to realize god to realize the kingdom of heaven is what is also known as to realize, realize the kingdom of self now there are those whom we call avatars or incarnations of god in other words we have this understanding according to the scriptures 
and according to those who have known the truth of Brahman or God, that God does incarnate from time to time to to keep up continuing the truth of eternal religion. The, the cycle moves in waves, ups and downs. Civilization moves in ups and downs. And as such, whenever there is a downward movement, there is a great soul born, who is known as Divine Incarnation. Now again, these Divine Incarnations are born with the knowledge of God. As you find Christ discussing religion with the rabbis when he was only twelve years old, in the life of Sri Ramakrishna we find how when he was six years old he had the complete vision of God. Then again, there is another class who are also born with the knowledge of God. These are called Ishara Kotis. Generally, they come as associates of a divine incarnation to carry on his message. And these are born free, which means from their very birth they have the experience of God. Now again, we must consider that a divine incarnation or these Ishara Kotis, though they are born with the knowledge of God, we find them struggling again, struggling hard, which seems a little difficult to understand. Of course, in the life of Christ we do not find how many years he struggled because that part is missing. because historically it has not been recorded. But in the life of Ramakrishna, in this present age, in the life of Buddha also, from which history began in India, we find how he struggled again to attain. And the idea is this, that God descends as man to show man how to ascend towards Godhead. If they do not struggle, if they do not show us the way, the path to attain, then how should we know? Then again, about this Ishara Kotis, it is said that first the fruits and then the flowers. They are born with the fruits, that is, they are born with the knowledge of God, and then again they practice sadhana or spiritual disciplines. My master was an Ishara Koti. At one time he said to me, Why do you have to practice anything? I have, we have done all that for you. In other words, again, it is pointed out that if we can learn to love any divine incarnation, that also is a struggle to love. Or any of these Ishara Kotis or your gurus, then through that love 
for God. By guru I mean one who has attained Brahman, one who has attained the knowledge of Brahman, and who has attained the knowledge of Brahman has become one with Brahman. And by loving such a person, loving a divine incarnation, you attain to the very highest truth. But there is also struggle there. Then again there is another class of people who suddenly become illumined. There are instances like that. They lived perhaps a very wayward life and suddenly they become illumined. Of course there we find divine grace suddenly it is descended upon such people, but if we do not know the past, the past. We do not know the struggles he had undergone in the past, but we only see this one life, and in this one life we find them suddenly becoming illumined. There are many such instances. Then again, there are another cl- there is another class of people who went to sleep suddenly they find themselves in samadhi that they are known as they attain that attain their knowledge of god while dreaming but not ordinary dream, not just seeing, seeing a holy personality, but all the experiences of ecstasy and samadhi are experienced. Then, again, as a general rule, there is another class of people who have to struggle in order to realize God. And as I shall point out presently, that how? Through struggles also, when they realize God, they realize it was the divine grace that descended upon them, which made them realize the truth of God. Then again, another class of people who are known as bound. That is to say, they never think of God, they never care for God. They do not make any attempt or they do not struggle to realize God. They remain in bondage. There is no desire in them, awakened as yet to realize God, to find God. How many, there are millions of Hindus, millions of Christians, millions of Muslims, but amongst them how many really desire to realize or know God? So the most important thing to begin with is the longing is the desire for God. And if one has only a little desire, that little longing, that little desire can be intensified and when that longing becomes intensified, the grace of God descends upon him. Many people have a misunderstanding that if they read the scriptures, if they believe in what is written in the scriptures, that is enough for religion. They don't have to do anything. So you find people are reading the Bible regularly, reading the Bhagavad Gita regularly, and so on and so forth. 
but they do not understand what is meant by the study of the scriptures. It is to follow the methods, the ways that are given in the scriptures to live the life. As I told you many times how when I went to study the Bhagavad Gita with a man of God, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, was also a great scholar. And he said, you have understanding of Sanskrit. The verses are easy to understand. Now live the life. Read a verse and live the life for some days. Then only you will understand what is meant in the Gita. There is a parable of Sri Ramakrishna, of a great scholar, and he had to go across the river. <clears throat> and so he asked the ferryman to take him across. He gave some money, and the ferryman was carrying him. And in order to show his learning, this scholar began to ask him, Have you studied Sankhya philosophy? No, sir. Do you know anything about Vedanta philosophy? No, no, sir. Have you studied any kind of philosophy or religion? No, sir. So he began to expound the scriptures. And then suddenly a storm arose. And the ferry boat was about to be drowned. And this man said, Holy Sir, do you know how to swim? <laughs> and he said, No. And then I said, I can't help you. Goodbye. <laughs> Similarly, study of the scriptures or philosophy does not help us, but we must learn the way to swim across this ocean of worldliness in order to reach that other shore to enter into that kingdom of God. As the great seer philosopher Shankara points out, erudition, well-articulated speech, a wealth of words, and skill in expounding the scriptures, these things give pleasure to the learned, but they do not bring liberation. Study of the scriptures is fruitless as long as Brahman has not been experienced. A network of words is like a dense forest which causes the mind to wander hither and thither. Therefore, those who know this truth should struggle to experience Brahman. Now that doesn't mean you should not study the scriptures or books, you know. They are the, in the office, they, they'll get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the ideal is, as you will understand clearly, if I put it in a negative way, which the great philosopher Kapila has done, or Buddha has done, it is a complete cessation of suffering and misery. And this complete cessation of suffering and misery is due to ignorance. <coughs> and in order to remove this ignorance, we have to have another uh, direct 
an immediate experience. Our suffering is direct and immediate experience. To remove that suffering we have to have another direct and immediate experience. Of course, each one of us is struggling to free ourselves from sufferings and miseries. But most of us are just like animals who, 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 uh, who looks only at a at looks only a few feet ahead of them. They have not that greater vision. Similarly, most of us, when the suffering comes, when suf misery comes, we try to get rid of that suffering and misery particularly, and we get rid of them. But we do not go to the root cause of all suffering. And then it is that there is a complete cessation of suffering and misery. So it is said that ignorance is the cause of this, and this ignorance can be removed by enlightenment, knowledge of God. <coughs> As I said already, that if there is only a little desire left in us, and as we struggle and follow the spiritual disciplines, a greater longing will come to us. Do not think that just because you begin your spiritual life or you are practicing uh, certain virtues in life or practicing meditation, and practice prayer regularly that you have perfect immediately. It takes time. My master, whenever we would complain to him, he would say, practice, 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 struggle, struggle, struggle. And then he would, would, he would say, unless you are thirsty, if I put the drink before you, you would not enjoy it. So when you are thirsty, it is then that you enjoy the drink. Similarly, we have to thirst, we have to long for God. Now again, those who have realized God and I have had the blessed fortune to associate with quite a few of such, not many, but a few. And each one of them said, grace, grace, <coughs> grace. And also at the same time all these great ones want us to struggle. And also pointed out that you will realize that you are struggling also through the grace of God. <coughs> now before I come to uh, bring the reconciliation, uh, let me quote the scriptures where also it is pointed out that you need the grace. In the teachings of Christ we, we find Christ said, Ye have not chosen me, I have chosen you. In the Upanishads we read, the Atman is not known through the study of the scriptures, nor through subtlety of intellect, nor through much learning. Whom the Atman chooses, by him is he attained. 
verily does the Atman unto him reveal his true nature. Now again let me point out how it's a psychological and mystical experience felt and experienced definitely the grace of God. <clears throat> For instance, while you are meditating, you know, this, this is felt and experienced by different people in many different ways. <coughs> <coughs> For instance, you are meditating, you are struggling, your mind is distracted, restless, and then suddenly you feel a power. And in the beginning you feel as if you are going to lose this consciousness. And you wake up, you are afraid, because there is the instinctive thirst for life. And the instinctive thirst for life means the surface life. And we feel we are going to die. And you wake up. But there comes a time when, though you are fearful, it, it strikes you like a thunder or as if an earthquake. And you are afraid, but you have no more any time to be afraid. You are ushered into the domain, a domain completely unknown to you, but you feel the presence of God. You have the vision of God. You have the experience of God. With that, your mind is filled with joy and bliss. <coughs> or, for instance, your mind is restless, you are meditating, suddenly you feel a power, a magnet drawing you unto itself, in spite of yourself. <coughs> now, from our standpoint of ignorance, there the question may be asked, if dependent upon grace, then why struggle? Is God partial that He shows his favour to some and he, he is not showing his favour to others? You see, this question generally arises. And this question arises when we think of God only as a being way above us, a personal being. <coughs> now, there is a God who is personal, but not above us is also within us. You know, <coughs> very interesting thing. I just read a sermon uh, that was published in the newspaper. I read sometimes to see the fun of it. <laughs> but this sermon I liked in a way because one thing he said that God is an, experiment, is an experienced fact which was a wonderful statement for a minister to state. <laughs> but then he said that this idea of impersonal God, that's all nonsense. 
God. We want to love God. We want the love of God to come to us and so on and so forth. He goes on. Well, you know, you know the story of Sri Ramakrishna. He, I, I don't deny, he may, not, he may have experienced God as a personal being, quite possible, <coughs> and which is wonderful. But, uh, you know, the story of ca- chameleon, yes, chameleon. You see, he saw just one color. That it changes color, he didn't see. And Sri Ramakrishna is to say, infinite is God, infinite are His aspects. He who lives in the consciousness of God always knows Him as personal as well as impersonal and also beyond. Now, What is this, this, what we call God? Whether he is personal or impersonal, he is dwelling within us. And each one of us has this consciousness. First, the consciousness, I am though we do not know what this I am is. But also we know that we are conscious. Now, this consciousness and this existence is possible to experience because of that pure consciousness that pure life or eternal existence within us. Without the presence of that pure consciousness, without the presence of God within us, it is not possible to move even our finger. We cannot think, we cannot live, we cannot breathe without that presence, is always there in the wicked, in the sinner, in the saint, in the good. Uh, St. Augustine uh, beautifully defined this truth by saying, God is a circle whose center is everywhere, but whose circumference is nowhere. In other words, how God's center is within each one of us. (coughs) Now again, that divinity that eternal life, pure consciousness and bliss and freedom that's already within us. In the Gita it is said, Agyanena abritam jnanam tena mujjanti jantavaha. The jnana, the knowledge of that is there in each one of us but covered by ignorance. And that's why we are deluded. Or take the teachings from the Bible. The light shineth in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. You know, what is this ignorance? You remember Lord's prayer, lead us not into temptations. What are these temptations? As Ramakrishna would say that this creation is the greatest temptation. God is showing His magic 
of this creation. And we are enamored by this magic. We do not want to know the magician. We are enamored by this creation. We do not seek to know the creator. In the Gita we find, pointed out, what is a man's will and how shall he use it? Let him put forth its powers to uncover the Atman, not hide the Atman. Man's will is the only friend of the Atman. His will is also the Atman's enemy. You see, so there is a greater stress laid upon self-struggle, self-effort. So on the one hand we have grace, on the other hand we have self-effort. Resolved or reconciled in a very simple way by Sri Ramakrishna. He said, the breeze of grace is blowing for everybody. Set your sail to catch that breeze. My master once said, you have the grace of Guru, you have the grace of God, you have the grace of his devotees, but for the grace of one you can be ruined. You have the grace of God, when I asked him, what does it mean? He said, you have received his name. And that name itself is the grace of God. But unless you have the grace of your own mind, nobody can help you. So there is no question of God being partial. Oh, uh, or because he, because his impersonal is something automat, like an automaton, you know they don't understand what impersonality doesn't mean. Nobody understands unless one realizes. But he's within you like a magnet, drawing all the time. But the needle of our mind is covered with dirt and dust. <coughs> And so Sri Ramakrishna would say, weep, 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 weep for him and let your tears wipe out that dirt and dust. <coughs> so when the impurities of the heart are wiped out, <coughs> then you see, you feel that magnet drawing you unto him, unto itself. God also, another name of God is Hari, one who steals the hearts of all. You see, he's stealing our heart, he's ready. And also Madhava, the sweet one. But the heart must long for him. This longing, of course, does not come, as I said, until we practice some disciplines. Now again, you now very interesting philosophical uh, idea is here. Shankara, you know, how, what a great seer philosopher he was, and he was a jnani, he was follower of path of knowledge. And he also pointed out very definitely how through divine grace alone you can reach that Atman. His opponent raised a question. You see, always Shankara is, has a beauty this way. He himself becomes an opponent of himself and raises his question. 
He says, God is infinite. And your struggles, howsoever you struggle, those struggles are finite. So how can finite struggles give you infinite result? Finite causes gives you finite effect. And you cannot struggle, you cannot struggle in an infinite way. Then Shankara points out, no, 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 no. What are you struggling for? Yes, your struggles are finite, but what are you struggling for? To remove something that is finite. And what is that? Ignorance. Ignorance is finite. As such, your struggles are, are to remove that finite ignorance and then the truth becomes revealed to you through that magnetic force. <coughs> now again, though I have emphasized this truth, that we have to be mumukshus, that is, we have to long for God, we have to have the desire for Him. So there are again different stages. First one is a prabhartha, that is, a beginner. And as a beginner he goes to this church, to that church, to this temple, to that temple, and he studies this scripture and that scripture, is seeking outside. And then he comes to an understanding, then he finds a guru, if he is sincere, he finds a guru, and then he learns to practice the disciplines. He becomes a sadhaka. Sadhaka is one who is following the spiritual discipline. Then, according to this, after sadhaka he becomes siddha, perfect. And this perfection comes to him when he realizes, he experiences that God He is convinced of that and he is right within himself that all knowledge is within me. This understanding comes, then he reaches the highest perfection when he, when that truth of God or the Atman becomes revealed to him. Osti first is experienced he is, then bhāti is manifest and his priya is the most beloved. You know, the illustration, Sri Ramakrishna gave an illustration, very interesting. You are seeking your beloved and there is a dark room. A dark chamber. And you have opened the door. Then you try to find where your beloved is. You touch a desk, no. You touch a chair, no. And then you touch the bed, no. Then you touch him, here he is. And so, first that asti he is. And then he wakes up. He reveals himself. And then he is your beloved. You realize that. 
is, he is, existence, then he is manifest, then you realize he is your beloved. Om Hari Om Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mritta Or Ma Abir Abir Maidhi Rudrajatte Dakshinam Mukam Te Namang Pahinityam Om Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from death to immortality. Lead us from darkness to light. Light us through and through and guide us evermore with thy loving presence. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.